Have you been through a challenging situation and wondered why you had to go through it? You're not the only one. Many people wonder why hardships exist. Why does God allow us to go through trials, tests, sorrows, or heartbreak? Where is He when bad things are happening? Why does He not intervene? These are questions I used to ask myself. I know many are asking the same questions I used to ask. While I don't have all the answers, over the years I've grown in wisdom and insight and understand better why God operates the way He does. Today, I want to help us understand why the testing of our faith is important and what it means for us believers. Let's first unpack the difference between tests and temptations. Tests are allowed by God so that we may come to know how trustworthy and faithful He is. God permits tests for the exercise of our faith, the same way we exercise our bodies to grow stronger. It may be hard to understand, but tests are for our good. The Apostle James says in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. During tests, we learn that His grace is truly sufficient for us. We learn to rely on Him and trust in Him. Temptations, on the other hand, are from the devil, and His intentions are always evil. They are one of the enemy's strategies to entice us to sin and cause us to stray from the love of God. While passing tests results in good, yielding to temptation leads us to destruction. Like the liar he is, the devil hides temptations behind tests. Often we encounter temptations while going through a test of our faith. Satan is a ruthless adversary who will tempt us during the test to make us fail. Here's a perfect example. Led by the Holy Spirit, Jesus went into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days and nights. At the end of his fast, the devil came to tempt him. He wanted Jesus to fail the test and tempted him when he was most vulnerable, at the end of the fast when he was hungry. Three times Satan tempted Jesus, and three times Jesus overcame the temptations. Jesus overcame the temptations by standing on God's Word, the Scriptures. The same weapon, the Word of God, used to defeat the enemy is available for us to use today. If Jesus used scriptures to defeat the devil, we should also use them. Let's look at how you, as a believer, can successfully navigate through tests and trials and come out victorious. During tests, do not despair, but remember that God is with you. He is watching you and cheering you on. God wants you to know that you're not alone. He's with you to walk through the difficult times and to give you victory. God is saying to you in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You can rely on God and experience His faithfulness. His grace is sufficient for you. When you are weak, He is strong. Whatever it is, stay the course until you overcome it. Win. You're a winner and a conqueror through Him who strengthens you. In addition, tests and trials open your eyes to His power, love, grace, mercy, and kindness. During the testing of our faith, never forget that your pain is not in vain. It has a purpose. It's not meant to crush you, but to establish you in the Lord. We can see this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. The testing of your faith is not meaningless. There is a purpose. The result is not devastation, frustration, hurt, or disappointment. God has something He wants to do with you, for you, and through you. At the end of the test, He restores you and establishes you. There is a restoration of your joy and happiness. He gives you a renewed passion for Him and the kingdom. He enables you to be happy and to rejoice in Christ again. At the end of the trial, you will receive growth, insight, and knowledge. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 says, for a little while you may have had to suffer in grief in various trials, so that the authenticity of your faith, more precious than gold, 
which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You may not understand how all you're going through will work out for your good, but you can trust Jesus. You can trust that all things work for the good of those who love Him. You are one of those who love Him. During testing periods, keep calm and remember His love for you. Picture a dad watching his child in a race, smiling and urging the child to keep pressing on and not to quit. Like the supportive dad, God is cheering you on, speaking words of encouragement and strengthening you when you're weak. And He does it out of love and kindness to us. God tests our faith, not because He doesn't know, but because He wants us to know too. He provides a way for us to measure our faith by His grace. God wants us to know how much we can trust Him, how much we can depend on Him for strength during hard times. Lastly, faith is like a muscle. The more we use it, the stronger it gets. It doesn't wear out with use, but increases. As we go through different situations and apply our faith, we increase our trust in God. In the book of James, we read that faith without action is dead. During tests, God gives us opportunities to put our faith to work. Once we've gone through the process and have allowed patience and endurance to have full play, we'll be spiritually mature, lacking nothing. When we seek Him from our little faith, He proves faithful. When we rely on Him to get us through our weak moments, He proves to be our strength. Through daily reliance on Him, our faith begins and continues to grow. So what should you do when your faith is being tested through the furnace of affliction? Hold on to God. Don't let go of your faith in God no matter how bad the situation is. Let God add to your cup of faith by remaining steadfast and grounded in Him. Pray to Him to help your unbelief, to expand your capacity to trust Him. Ask Him to open your heart to greater wisdom and knowledge, to bring His super to your natural. Ask Him to fill in the gaps in your faith so that through Him, you can stand and accomplish what in your own strength you could not. Remember this when God allows us to go through trials. He uses the circumstances to draw us closer to Him. Through the testing, our character is molded into Christ-likeness. You can rejoice in God through the tests. Like Job, you too can say, but He knows the way that I take. When He has tested me, I will come forth as gold. In a nutshell, being tested is simply a part of the process of becoming more like Christ. He wants us to succeed. The more we lean into Him, the more grace He can pour onto us. God allows us to be tested because He loves us dearly and wants us to grow in grace and the knowledge of Him. Trials show that our faith is genuine. When our faith remains strong through many trials, it will result in much praise, glory, and honor at the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Honestly, there are times when God seems to be the most fictional being we've ever heard, especially during those times when life is so hard. When we're going through the worst kind of pain because of the loss of a dear one, when our families are having crises left, right, and center, when the world is so violent and all around us are the news of massive killings, terrorist attacks, natural disasters, hunger, drought, and starvation, we can't help but wonder, where is God when all this is happening? Where was God when our loved ones were on their deathbeds and crying out to Him? Where is the God who is said to be our healer? Where is God when we get fired from our jobs and how our landlord threatens to kick us out of the house since we can't pay the rent anymore? Where is God when we're going through all these challenges and there's no hope of ever getting out of them? Where is He when life becomes miserable and death sounds so appealing? Where is God when our dreams are shattered and the hope we had for the future is lost? Is He still seated on the throne? Is He still as powerful? Does He still listen to our prayers? Does He care for us? Or has He forsaken us? Most of us have asked this question during times when we can't help but question the presence of God in our lives and whether He still intervenes in our situations. Even Jesus Himself asked this question. In case you haven't gotten to this point in life, this is the message that the Holy One of Israel is giving you today. You might be thinking that this is your end, 
you might be thinking there is no possible way out of the mess that your life is in right now. You might be convinced that those dreams you had for the future were nothing more than a wild imagination. But this is what the Lord is saying to you today, that He is not yet done with you. He is far from being finished with you. It's not over until God says it's over. It might look like that valley of dry bones that Ezekiel prophesied to. Looking with our human eyes, it must have appeared to be the end of it for those bones, lying there lifeless, dry, and abandoned in a valley. It must have seemed like that was their destiny, but God talked to Ezekiel and told them, no, I'm not yet done with the bones. I'm far from completing the work that I want them to accomplish. So go on, son of man, and prophesy to the dry bones. Prophesy breath and flesh over them, and the bones shall live again. And the same can happen in your situation today. No matter how hopeless it looks, no matter how many dead ends you have hit before, no matter how many people have told you that you can't make it and you're supposed to give up, I'm giving you this assurance that the Lord is not done with you yet. He's far from being so. His word in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 tells us this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. People can have their opinions about you or your life, but they don't have the final say. The final word over your life comes from God Almighty, who made heaven and earth. It's only He who knows your origin and your destiny. It's only He that knows at what point of your life that you're in. Your loving Father has your life in His hands, and you have a duty on your end, and this is to keep praying. But I know it's hard to keep praying when the prayers you made last year, last month, or a decade ago haven't been answered yet, when you can't see any change in your life. Today is still the same as yesterday, or even worse. But this is what you ought to keep doing, praying. Prayer is the weapon we have been given against the power and forces and principalities of this dark world, which are the root of all evil that happens to and around us. It is what Paul refers to in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Prayer is the key to overcoming anything that we face in this life. All challenges and problems are under the authority of prayer. And so if you can take a moment to pray about your situation, then for sure it can change. Sure, some prayers take time to be answered, but we should always have in mind that when God says wait, He hasn't denied us what we asked in prayer. He's simply waiting for the perfect time to grant us our requests according to His perfect will and timing. Remember, God does not at any point operate in our timeline. Many times we feel so behind and left out in life because we gauge our progress through our physical and not spiritual eyes. We compare ourselves to other people, not realizing that God has a whole different and wholesome plan for us, which is unique to us alone. Our lives are not meant to be exactly like any other person's, and so we should entrust God with our plans and cease comparing ourselves to others. When we feel like it's taking too long, we should up our prayer game. It's not the time to give up on God. God Himself will never give up on you, so why should you give up on Him? When you feel like you've reached your breaking point, I encourage you to pray even more. In the parable of the widow and the unjust judge, it was the widow's persistence and not just the character of the judge that gave her justice. We can learn a thing or two about persistence from this widow, praying without ceasing. That is what the Bible encourages us to do. Prayer requires persistence and consistency. Even when the results are not as fast or immediate as you might have hoped, keep on praying. There is no more powerful Christian as the one who has a vibrant prayer life. Prayer overcomes all challenges. It heals all illnesses. It provides a way where there seems to be none. It delivers us out of the pangs of death and keeps us safe in the embrace of our God. And when you pray, don't forget the main ingredient of prayer, and that is faith. Faith is what activates your prayer and gives it the power to penetrate the spiritual realms into the physical. Prayer and faith go hand in hand. Those two can't be separated. Prayers that are not accompanied by faith are just dormant words that lack the power to bear fruit. 
Faith is what gives your prayer power to stand up in the face of hardships. The Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 has the easiest definition of faith. Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. When you have faith, you're choosing to believe what you can't see, choosing to believe that you will one day see what you have in mind. Prayer and faith are what we use to claim the promises of God in our lives. When you're worried about what you'll eat tomorrow, grab your Bible and turn to Matthew 7. Read the Word of God and own it over your life. What does the scripture say about lack, material things, worldly possessions? It tells us not to be worried because God will provide for us. Now take that up and affirm it over your life. God, I thank you for the provision you have assured me in Matthew chapter 7. I thank you because you are faithful and you are true to your word. I thank you because even though I might feel like I've come to an end and I don't see a way out, I know that you are God, seated on your throne, and you'll never put to shame those who call upon you. I trust you for my provision. This affirmation will help you push on. When you feel lost, without direction, when you don't know what you're doing anymore, remember that the Lord has promised to be your guard and guide. He is a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. Anytime you're not sure of where you're headed anymore, call upon the name of the Lord and believe that He will guide you in the direction He wants you to go. When you need redemption, remember that the Lord is your Redeemer. He saves, restores, and gives back what has been taken from you, even when it feels like His love is so distant. Trust me, the Lord is near to you. He says that He is close to the brokenhearted and will never forsake those who call unto Him. If He gave up His only Son to die on the cross for your sins, what won't He do for your salvation? He is faithful and He loves you unconditionally. The Lord will never give up on you. When you need a friend, He is one. When you're feeling low, this is what He tells you in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. God has made a promise to us in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 3. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. God will never forsake nor abandon you. He will never leave you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. He will uphold you with His righteous right hand, and He will deliver you safely out of the situations that threaten to destroy you. He is not done with you. Even when it seems like He is, just remember His promises and how faithful He has been to you in the past. Keep on praying. Keep believing that God, in His own time, will release your miracle. It may not be today or tomorrow, but we have this great confidence in the Lord our God that anything we ask of Him in prayer by faith, He will give unto us. So keep on praying and trusting in Him. Praising God Through Your Trials have you ever gone through a hard time in your life? I'm sure the answer is yes. A hard time might be an understatement because many of us have been through hard times at different points in our lives. I can share many quotes about rejoicing during hard times. And after some research, I can come up with even hundreds more. The reality is that while quotes can make you feel better for a moment, the feeling does not last. Hard times will always be that, hard times. We may feel comforted, but we still have a process we need to go through. Think of a time when you felt like the weight of the world was on your shoulders and the circumstances were too heavy for you to bear. You may have experienced so much distress that you felt like you could not take one more breath you might even have wished to die. 
your heart felt heavy, and you walked around with a sad face. It might have gone on for hours, days, weeks, or years. You felt defeated and made peace that the circumstances would be your lot in life. You said to yourself, get used to it. This is your life. You have no choice but to get used to it. Did you take a minute to think that you had a choice? You could even be going through a rough patch in your life right now. I am here to tell you that you have not run out of options. You still have an ace up your sleeve. What I am going to share is applicable in all circumstances. It will inspire you and stir your spirit so that you can respond appropriately to the challenging situation you are facing. When you are going through hard times, you still have choices. You can choose to stay down and defeated, hopeless, in a sad state, or you can choose to rise above your pain through praise. Praise is a response that goes beyond your feelings. It is way above how you think things are going to end or what you think your circumstances are saying. You can choose to praise God even when it hurts. Yes. That's right, praising God in the midst of a battle. I know we are used to praising God when life is great and rejoicing when our lives are stable. It's easy to believe in God when we can see the evidence of His work. It's not hard to be happy, spiritual, faithful believers when things are going great for us. It's easy to praise God when all of our problems are resolved, the sun is shining, and we have no worries. What happens when disaster strikes, our lives take an undesirable turn, or things start heading south? Should our praise be confined to these moments when we are well? Definitely not. We should praise God even in tough circumstances. Does this mean we should numb our feelings to the pain or pretend our problems don't exist? No, not at all. We are simply choosing not to be defeated by our circumstances. It is refusing to remain intimidated by our pain and problems and choosing to see the one who is greater than any problem. When we praise God in the midst of it all, we are walking by faith and not by sight. We are declaring that He can deliver us from whatever is afflicting us. We are making our faith and trust in Him greater than the suffering and pain that situations may put us through. I admit that walking by faith does not come naturally. Praising God in a tight spot does sound odd, but it is still the way to your breakthrough. I know it does not make sense, and that is why it is an act of faith. It is only by the power of God that we can praise Him in our pain. Hebrews 13.15 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess His name. If we depend on our flesh to rejoice or praise God while in a trial, we will eventually burn out. Praising and rejoicing in God in the middle of trials is a deep act of surrender. It causes us to acknowledge that we cannot muster up the sustained might to defeat the enemy coming against us in our strength. We need the Lord to deliver us by His mighty hand. The Bible acknowledges that praise is an act of sacrifice, especially in times of distress and pain. Praising God, rejoicing in Him, and being joyful is not easy when experiencing hard times. When our strength and power fail, we can rely on God. His is unmatched, limitless, and inexhaustible. His boundless power is always working in our lives. If we tap into it, we can overcome anything we face. When dealing with a situation that hurts and puts you through untold pain, you can still choose to praise God. You can acknowledge His mercy and redeeming power even in the middle of an ordeal. You can thank Him for His deliverance and salvation while still in pain. You can ignore what your thoughts, emotions, and circumstances are telling you and praise God instead. The pain may not end immediately, but you can focus on something else 
that brings you relief and hope for a better day. You can be assured of God's unconditional love and presence in your life, even when your surroundings may be saying otherwise. When you are going through a hard time, the devil will tell you all sorts of lies. He will lie to you that God does not love you and does not care about you and is unbothered by your plight. What a lie that is. The word in 1 Peter 5, 7 and Psalm 55, 22 assures us that God cares. Casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns once and for all on him, for he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. Cast your burden on the Lord, releasing the weight of it, and he will sustain you. He will never allow the consistently righteous to be moved or made to slip, fall, or fail. If you stay stuck in that hole of self-pity and despair, you will find yourself believing the devil's lies. His ideas will become etched in your mind unless you have something that counters them. The devil will try to take over territories of your life one piece at a time. He will use these low and vulnerable moments of your life. Reclaim those territories in Jesus' name. The scripture highlights the importance of taking your thoughts captive and casting down imaginations and every high thing that looks to exalt itself above the truth. Scriptures, energized by God's Spirit, are powerful. If you are born again, baptized in the Spirit, and actively walking in the Word, you have access to victory in everything. You can rise above hard times with praise. You can stand on your feet by faith and endure hardship. It will not be easy, but the Lord is your comfort. A popular quote says that serenity is not freedom from the storm, but peace amid the storm. You can still have peace and praise God even during the hard times. It does not mean that you put an emotional guard around yourself, but that you see God as who He is, greater than any problem. Praising God amidst your pain does not always look like it. Staying in bed all day, curled up under the sheets, soaking your pillows with tears, but muttering the word of God to yourself is still raising God above the circumstances. You are assuring yourself of His promises and faithfulness to keep them. You are declaring that no matter what you face, God will always show up for you. Isaiah 64, 4 says, For from of old no one has heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen a God beside you, who works and shows himself active on behalf of him who earnestly waits for him. Look what Paul and Silas did. Arrested, severely beaten, and thrown into prison, chained with no hope of getting out, they still praised the Lord. Right in that heavily guarded prison cell, through their physical and emotional pain, they found a reason to worship God. They must have been hurting badly, but they did not allow the pain to stop them. Praise and faith got Paul and Silas out of prison that night. In a spectacular event, their songs and worship touched God. He broke their chains, opened the prison doors, and set them free. And that is how they overcame. What an example Paul and Silas are to you and me. You can praise God even when you are hurting. You can praise God when your heart is bleeding from hurt. You can praise God even when life has beaten you up and struck you when down. Whether God miraculously breaks you out of the prison you are in today or chooses to let you stay for a while, praise Him. Praise touches God and opens the gate of heaven to miracles and wonders. It acknowledges God as the one who speaks to seas and overcomes waves and does exceedingly, abundantly, more than we can ever ask, think, or imagine. He does infinitely above our highest expectations. Your painful points may include rejection, loneliness, financial stress, guilt over past mistakes, fear of the future, chronic caregiving, marital strife, or a friend who let you down. Ask the Lord to help you be emboldened and not embittered in your faith as you journey with Jesus 
through the trials. God inhabits the praises of his people. Psalm 22, 3. Praise God in your pain and give glory to his name. The sacrifice of praise sets you free to serve in the Spirit's strength. While God is working on removing your pain points, you can still be free of your pain. Pray that while in your trial, He will help you praise Him as you lean into His love and comfort. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in Him, and He helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song, I praise Him. Psalm 28.7 Inherent in human nature is the natural trait to worry. Humans worry about many situations, especially the future. As a believer, the tendency to worry must be replaced with a heart that trusts God and depends solely on Him. God has created you for a purpose, and it will be fulfilled in your life. God has good plans for you. He will lead you through to an expected end. Matthew 6.25 says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Jesus wants you to cast all your fears and burdens at his feet, because he cares for you. Worries and anxiety don't change anything, but only ruin everything. Anxiety steals your joy and troubles your soul. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Philippians 4, 6. He is faithful enough to answer. The Father desires that you seek the kingdom first, and all other things will be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. God knows your needs. He is aware beforehand what you'll need for each day, and they are all in his banquet of provisions. Worrying about them is underestimating his ability to supply, or remember that you'll be in need. All he desires is for you to truly love him and know him as a father, and not just for what he has to offer. God is interested in your intimate relationship with him, not just his blessings. When he is certain that you love him, he will perfect everything that concerns you. God wants you to trust him, because he alone can make your life beautiful. Your wisdom or strength cannot guarantee a successful future. It's only in him that you can find rest and happiness. Remember, man can make propositions, but it's only God that is in the position to affirm them. Your plans for your future cannot come to pass if God does not approve of them. Why then do you trust in yourself? Why worry when he can make everything perfect at his time? Perhaps you envy other people's timing. You don't have to compare yourself to others. God wants you to recognize his ability to guide all the steps of your life. He wants to be with you in all situations. Trusting him is the key to activating all this. When you trust God, you don't figure out anything else, but depend solely on him to change things. Trusting God is being at peace with yourself while God does his work in your life. It's handing over what would ordinarily make you unhappy and worried to God to handle it on your behalf. You may not have the answers, but God does. He is ready to take care of all your needs, transform your life, and give you a beautiful end. Cast your fears on Him, for He cares for you. Worrying is the direct opposite of faith. It's either you have worry or faith. I implore you to choose faith. Jesus taught his followers that even a little faith, like a grain of mustard seed, can move mountains. God has the solution to the challenges in your life. He is all-knowing. He knows the best for you. He sees what you can't see and knows what you don't know. He just wants you to follow him all the way. No one loves you more than God. His love is magnificent and blameless. Worry and anxiety will only exist if you allow them in your thoughts. Trust is a choice. You have to choose to trust God or depend on your strength. If you choose the former, you will excel, but if you opt for the latter, you will keep going back in circles with an uncertain future. The devil wants you to feel dejected. When he attacks you with a million reasons to worry, give him one reason to trust God. 
God's love is immense. You can come to him with everything and be rest assured that he will sort them out. Challenges will come, but God has promised victory. He is your promoter, provider, and waymaker. He has everything you need and want. He is peace. Why not rest in his arms? You should daily walk in his promises for you. He doesn't want you to be overwhelmed by troubles, but by his love. Jesus says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Let him handle yours for you. Always remember that one of the biggest enemies you will face in life is anxiety. There will be things that will be in your control and things that won't. Nevertheless, God wants you to always be joyful. Do not exert your energy on worry. Do not magnify your fears and challenges. Instead, magnify God. He wants you to thank him in advance while you still anticipate your miracle. When you do this, you are exalting God, not your problems. Walk by faith and not by sight. Stay at peace with God. Stay at peace in your mind and in your soul. The grace of the Lord is sufficient and perfect always. When worry and anxiety come to your mind, fight them with the weapon of worship and watch as God's presence takes control. The joy of the Lord will intervene and convert them to blessings. Be a different person today. Focus on God. Avoid worrying. Call on the name of the Lord, for his name is mighty and a strong tower built for your deliverance. God is your hope for a glorious future. The future can be scary. Being in total darkness about what will happen tomorrow, 10 years to come, or even in the next hour is something we do not feel comfortable with. As humans, we often find comfort and solace knowing in what will happen tomorrow and getting prepared for it. As a young person, whether in college or just out of school, you may feel pressure to have the life you always desired, not knowing whether you'll actually get a job, find a life partner, have adorable kids or an amazing family, or make it to old age can make you worry. The uncertainty of what tomorrow will come with makes one not fully enjoy the present moment. Everyone has something about the future that makes them anxious. It could be financial, academic, a child, an opportunity that is slipping away, a partner, relationship, marriage, or anything. However, as God's beloved children, we should not worry because God has our future in his hands. He knows what will happen tomorrow and prepares us adequately for it today. He makes sure that nothing catches us by surprise. And when it does, we realize that he has been making us ready for it all along. We might have not seen it when we were on the training ground, but at the real battle, we see why we went through some situations. Your future is in God's hands. You have no reason to worry at all, but you have all the reasons to be happy, calm, and at peace because even though you may not know what it holds, you know who holds it. In the midst of all the pressure to get your life together, to make it and get financially stable, I want to tell you that you shouldn't worry at all nor fear. God has a plan for you and it's good, perfect, and the best one ever. His plan has you at the center, and everything that happens right now is for the good of your next moment. Learn to stop worrying about your future and leave it in God's hands. When you do, you will begin to see His goodness in everything. Leave your worry, fears, anxiety, and stress over what will happen tomorrow in His hands. That is where they belong. The hands that calmed the storm and gave sight to the blind are the same hands that are holding your future. Put your financial struggles and desires in the hands of the one who owns everything, including gold and silver, and he will provide all your needs and give you security and peace. God speaks to us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 27. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? God does not want us to worry about anything. He assures us that He's got our future in His hands and everything is planned out. Furthermore, His are not just mere plans, but plans for prosperity and not destruction. Plans to give us a future and a hope. 
plans that will do us all good if we choose to trust in Him. Do not be afraid about tomorrow and do not be discouraged. Everything has been secured in the hands of the Most High. He has given you and me a promise in Isaiah chapter 41, verses 9 and 10. I took you from the ends of the earth and from its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Even if you're feeling stuck, don't give up yet. Keep trusting in God. By looking with the human eyes, the future might appear so bleak, empty, and dark. But God knows what He's doing. He is setting the scene for your uplifting. If you leave it in His hands, at the right time, He will make everything beautiful. Moreover, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. More often than not, we say we've left everything in God's hands, yet we go ahead and take it back. This happens when we ask Him to take control, but we continue to worry, lament, complain, and whine about it. If you struggle with this, you can pray to God to help you to completely leave it all to Him. Whatever it is, whatever it is giving you sleepless nights, I encourage you by praying, reading the Word of God, meditating, and fellowshipping with other believers over other faith-building activities to trust in God fully and stop worrying about your future. God wants us to love Him with our entire being. When we do, everything else falls into place. When asked by a Pharisee what the greatest commandment was, Jesus answered saying, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Matthew 22, 37. Loving God means putting Him first. Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Take a hard look at your life. Are you serving God or the world? When you are experiencing financial trouble, do you turn to God or do you stew in your stress? When life takes an unexpected turn, do you become angry or anxious or do you remain calm, knowing that God is leading you where He wants you to go? When you allow worry to take over your life, you are not putting God first. Look at what Matthew 6.25 says. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Life is not about money, having the best house or the best car. It's not about dressing in the most fabulous clothes or eating the most exotic food. Life is about serving and loving God. When we do, we can trust that everything will work out. Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. When we place God first and obey his commands, our focus is on heaven rather than on earth. We see an example of absolute trust and surrender in Genesis 22 when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son. Abraham obeyed, even though Isaac was extremely precious to him. He was the son born out of God's promise to him, the one God said through him Abraham's descendants would be reckoned. Abraham trusted God so much that on the way to the mountain, when Isaac asked his father where the lamb was, Abraham replied, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham believed that God could raise the dead, and in a sense, he did receive Isaac from the dead. Abraham's love for God was the only thing that kept him going. He probably wondered why God was doing this to him. He may even have been angry about it, but his steps did not falter. Despite what he might have been feeling, Abraham obeyed God. We know that before Abraham could sacrifice his son, an angel of the Lord called out to him to stop. God provided a ram for the sacrifice instead, and Isaac was spared. We read in Genesis 22:15 through 18 what God said to Abraham to commend him for his obedience. 
the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Abraham received a wonderful blessing for his willingness to obey the Lord. Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Abraham's faith was strengthened through this experience. God showed him that as long as he served him, he would be provided for. The same thing goes for you and me, friends. There will be times in our lives when God will ask us to do hard things that we would rather ignore God and go a different way. Jonah did just that. When God commanded him to go to Nineveh to preach to the people, Jonah did not want to. Instead of obeying God, he hopped on a ship to Tarshish to flee from the Lord's command. Despite Jonah's disobedience, God did not give up on him. He sent a storm so severe that the sailors reluctantly had to throw Jonah overboard when he confessed to them that he was the cause of the storm. God then sent a whale to swallow Jonah. While in the belly of the whale, Jonah offered a heartfelt prayer to God and said, Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. Jonah 2, 8 through 9. Jonah recognized that it was better to obey God and live for him rather than live for idols. When Jonah was released from the whale, God again commanded him to go to Nineveh. This time, Jonah obeyed. He preached to the people about the destruction God would bring upon them for their wickedness if they did not repent. The Ninevites repented of their sins and were saved from God's destruction. Jonah 3.10 says, When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. When God calls you to perform a difficult task, how do you react? Are you like Abraham, willing to sacrifice the thing you cherish the most? Or are you like Jonah, too stubborn to follow God? Unlike Jonah, Abraham placed all his trust in God. He wasn't afraid to follow his commands. Jonah, on the other hand, was more concerned with the consequences of what God was asking him to do than with obeying him. He held on to his earthly pride rather than to God. There will be times when following God will have deadly earthly consequences. Paul suffered much persecution while he spread the word of God and ultimately gave his life to God. His reward was in heaven. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When you live your life for Christ, you can look forward to an eternity in heaven. Our earthly lives are temporary, but heaven is forever. When you follow God, you never have to worry about going in the wrong direction, because he will never lead you astray. At times, obedience is rewarded here on earth, and there are times when we have to wait for our heavenly reward. Let's take a look at the widow who helped God's prophet Elijah. During a severe famine, God directed Elijah to go to the home of a widow and her son. At his arrival, hungry from the journey, Elijah asked for bread and water. But the woman said, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat and die. 1 Kings 17.12 The woman was on the brink of death and she thought if she gave her food to Elijah, she would be left with nothing. However, the next verse says, Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. 
and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the Lord sends rain on the land. The woman obeyed, and God's word was fulfilled. Verse 16 says, For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. If the woman had not helped Elijah, she and her son would probably have starved to death. Instead, she put God first, and everything fell into place. My friends, you may think that God is harsh for demanding sacrifices from us, but let us remember that He made the ultimate sacrifice when He sent His only Son to die on the cross to save us from our sins. The only reason we have an eternity in heaven to look forward to is because of Christ's death and resurrection. While God saved Abraham from sacrificing his son, he freely sacrificed his own. Remember this the next time God is asking you to make a sacrifice. When you are afraid of following God and putting him first, remember how much he loves you. If you trust in him, you will have nothing to fear. If you run away from God, you have chosen to serve Satan and the world instead of God. You are choosing to focus on your earthly life and sacrificing your life in heaven. Wouldn't you rather live a surrendered life on earth for the sake of your heavenly life with God? You cannot live both an earthly life with Satan and a heavenly life with God. You must choose one. Satan's path leads to death and destruction, but God's path leads to life and glory. My friends, take a long, hard look at your life today and make sure that you are putting God first in everything you do. Great things await you if you do. Spiritual warfare is our battle against the devil and everything associated with him. We can't choose whether to fight or not. The battle is already set against us even before we were born. The devil is on a rampage to get as many believers as he can before he runs out of time. A soldier does not stand on the battlefield and fold his arms. That soldier will get killed and buried unceremoniously. We are to fight with the armor God has made available to us. It may seem like the problems in your life never end. Everything around you becomes difficult. Things keep moving from bad to worse at an alarming speed. That tells you there's spiritual warfare. That is when you need to pull out your sword and wield it over the devil. You need to let him know that you will not succumb to his cheap games. But most times, believers are not sensitive enough. The goal of the devil is to kill, steal, and destroy. He will not stop at anything until he gets you to curse God. He wants to take away every precious thing in your life. He will not stop at anything until he sees that you have lost your faith. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8 NIV, Be alert and of a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The devil is always on the lookout for whom to devour. He is always moving to and fro to spread his influence around. Can you remember his conversation with God in the book of Job? God asked where he was coming from, and he said he was coming from walking to and fro the earth. His target is you and your faith in God. The sad thing is, you are not always vigilant. You often get carried away with the seeming calm you see that you forget you are still on the battlefield. You forget that the devil is still trying to take away your faith. He is doing everything in his power to steal your joy. He is not relenting in his aim to destroy your testimony. Every day, all believers are on the battlefield. We are fighting against sin. We are waging war against the craftiness of the devil. We are resisting the devil so that he will flee from us. Some days are harder than others in our fight against evil. We fight to live righteously. We fight to take out time from the distractions of the world to study our Bible. We resist every temptation and say no to the desires of the devil. Daily, we need to choose to please God rather than the devil. That is warfare. Ephesians 6.12 NIV says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is our reality as children of God. We are soldiers who have been enlisted in the army. Whether on the battlefield or in the barracks, we are constantly fighting and should be on guard. You can experience an intense attack from the devil. That is, when it seems as if all hell has broken loose on you. Everything in your life is not working. Your faith, which should be your sucker and drive to the place of prayer, suddenly vanishes. That is the point of warfare. Spiritual warfare can be in form of oppression or intimidation from the enemy. You might just find yourself losing the courage to stand up for the things you have once stood for. You discover that you can no longer speak up against evil. That is the time to activate your armor and fire them up. But most times, believers are too busy to even notice the little drift in their lives. Job was a model Christian whom God was proud of. The devil was angry at this. He wanted to take away Job's testimony. Job lost everything he had, including his children. I can't even begin to imagine how devastating that must have felt for him. He removed his clothes in sorrow, but never lost to the devil. After losing all he had, he was afflicted with a sickness that left him in ashes. His wife, who should encourage and cheer him up, chose to discourage him. She was tired of being called the wife of a wretched, sick man. She asked him to curse God and die. She was simply telling him to give the crown to the devil. Can you imagine how God would have felt if the devil went back to him to boast about winning over Job? It would have been a disgusting scenario. Thanks be to God, Job held on. He fought like a champion. He faced the difficulty without losing his faith. Then he said even if God should slay him, he would still praise him. Job won the fight. Are you also going to win the fight? Job had rested after his battle. He had received the crown. He is rejoicing now. Will you also receive the crown? Are you going to win the battle or drop your armor during battle? Will you allow the distractions from the world to drift you off thereby allowing the devil to win? In Ephesians 6.11 NIV, the Bible says, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. If we would not face battles, what do we need armor for? Think about it. Have you ever considered getting a weapon for your child? Weird, right? Exactly. You know your child does not need it. Why then do you think God provided an armor for us? It is because we would be fighting battles in this world. Jesus said in John 16:33 NIV, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus has already paid the price for our victory. He has won the battle for it already. All we have to do is stand and enforce his victory over our lives. You need to know that every day is another day to fight. Never believe the idea that there is a day you do not have to put on the full armor. The devil never relents. We are the ones who get too busy to pray fast or study our Bibles. We neglect our armors until the arrow reaches us. We are always on the battlefield. Each day, the battle between good and evil plays in us. The spirit fights against the flesh. Every action we take shows which part won the duel. There are times in your life when you receive special attention from the devil, just like Job had. Those are moments when every part of your life does not go the way it ought to go. That is a time for spiritual warfare. That is the time for you to enforce your victory. It is not the time to cringe, cower, or entertain fear. The time when persecution arises from every corner is a time for spiritual warfare. Can you think of a time when you felt like you were walking on swords? Everything around tries to take you back to your past. Your old friends may try to lure you back to your old habits. Your boss is threatening to fire you if you do not do what he is asking from you. Then your spouse starts acting up. You even think the devil has possessed them with the way they get irritated with every little thing you do. With everything going on, 
you feel you are about to lose your mind. That is when you know that the devil has proclaimed war on you. When the things you face get more intense than they used to be on normal days, the devil is out to get you. He focuses his attention on you and uses every trick in his book to get your back on the ground. Will you allow him? It might be that you have just lost interest in the things that are related to God. You no longer feel like reading your Bible or praying. Your spiritual commitments become boring. You prefer to do every other thing than to spend time doing the things of God. That is the sign of an attack. That is a time for you to drop everything and retreat into the presence of God. It is a time for you to stay with God until He restores your first love. Since we know that we are on a battlefield with the devil, we should never get caught unaware. We should not get lost in the things happening around us that we forget where we are. Our battle does not end with one victory. Because you overcame the temptation today does not mean that the devil will not tempt you tomorrow. Never relent in wielding your sword against the devil. Knowing that battles would come our way does not suffice. We must also be ready for them. God did not leave us helpless to the devil. He knew all that we would have to face as saints walking through this sinful world whose prince is the devil. God has prepared a way out for us. Like he turned everything around for Job, he will turn everything around for us. As long as we keep our armor on and are vigilant, we will not fall prey to the devil. Revelation 12, a NIV says, They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. The blood that Jesus shed for us on Calvary is a point for our victory. Don't keep running from pillar to post in search of a solution to the problems. It is time for you to go to God in prayer. Prayer is a strong weapon given to us. With it, we get to call the name of Jesus, step back, and watch Him enforce His victory on the situation. When facing challenges, we should not panic because Jesus has won the victory already. All we have to do is enforce it in our lives. Anything you notice in your life that is not according to God's will should not be left there. You should earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. That does not sound like being timid or passive. Our call is not to timidity or passivity. We are to stand in our offices and continuously fight against the enemy. I want you to know that the devil can never win against you if you do not allow him. He can try. I mean, he can use every trick at his disposal. He can fire every arrow he has. He can use every weapon in his armory. But he can never get you because Jesus said, he had overcome the world. The devil remains a defeated foe if you do not give him a chance to come in.